So as you can see behind my shoulders, today I'm running a free online masterclass. And uh, I've set up everything already. We are ready to go. We have five minutes before we begin the online event. We've got 35 people alone, which is amazing. And uh, I'm gonna show them how to make a sour culture. I'm gonna show them how to make a loaf. I'm gonna show them how to score it and how to bake it. And if we have more time, I have some ciabatta dough there that I would like to show them as well. So follow along and learn everything that needs to be learned about sourdough. So I think it's a uh, time to start. I'll tell you how I start my masterclass. I'll start straight from baking the bread. So by the time I'll teach you how to make your own sourdough culture, by the time I teach you how to work your dough to be able to make a sourdough loaf, the bread will bake and we'll be able to, I mean, if it was a, a public version of a masterclass, you'd be able to taste it at the end. We would have a little nibble, a coffee, a glass of wine, some cheese, some cured meats, some charcuterie. But in this case, we can't. So I'm going to show you exactly how I run it physically in Adelaide. And uh, it's exactly the same. So we bake the bread, we make the sourdough culture, we make the sourdough bread together, and then we'll see the end product. And if we have a bit of time, I've made some ciabatta dough that I wanna, that I would like to show you. So this is just a plus on whatever you decided to attend today. So I've set up my oven. It's a gas oven in this case, as you can see it behind there. And it's a maximum pump. It's at 220 degrees right now. And I have two baking vessels in there. One quite professional and one is just a normal cake tray because I want to show you that with what you have at home you're already able to make sourdough in the next couple of days and that's what I want to teach you so now I'm going to go and grab those two baking vessels and I'll show you what I do so this is the baking tray. Now we'll turn the camera down so we'll be able to see the procedure of everything. Baking paper and foil. Yeah. Here we are. Now you can see this is a baking tray, a classical cake tray that you can find anywhere. And I have two doughs. This one is one. And this one is the other. So let me finish one first. So I have a scoring blade, as you can see. This is a bread yama, comes from Canada. It's a wonderful family business. And I, I have them on my website if you are interested. Otherwise you can easily use a very sharp knife. You don't have to be fancy with things. And I, I love to teach people that everything is possible with just the stuff that you have at home. You don't have to purchase extra things unless you want to, of course. Then I will dust it with some extra flour in case he needs it, okay? And then I score nicely deep, like half a centimeter, okay? And then if you want to be a bit more of artistic pattern, you can do a little wheat flour like that. Now this one, it's very important when you bake that you collect the steam. Or you do, that you have some steam while you're baking. So I'm going to cover this one with some foil to be able to trust the steam then the, the actual bread is going to re release while baking, okay? So that's one. This one goes in the oven straight away. Put it at the top. And now I'm going to show you the other one. So this one is a more professional baking vessel, okay? It's Skitchen. That's produced in Indonesia, but it's sold by an Australian company from Brisbane. That's called Skitchen, S-K-I-T-C-H-E-N. And uh, it's a wonderful piece of equipment. If you want to bake bread regularly, I think it's a wonderful investment to do. But if you can afford it, as I showed you before, it's not necessary. So this is another loaf. As you can see, I made this one last night. 
so it's nice and firm. Now I'm going to show you with the knife. Knife will work anyway. Here we are. Diagonal, 45 degrees angle, nice and deep. And you can also do the scoring pattern. You don't need to be too fancy. Okay, nice and deep. Don't be afraid of cutting too deep. Put the lid on. And these two baking vessels have been preheated, which is very important if you wanna have a nice little lift in your bread. So now these two breads will bake for 40 minutes and the size of the loaf is around 800 and 900 grams. First thing that I wanna teach you, it's how to make the loaf. So in this bowl, as you can see, I've already weighted 450 grams of flour. I'll suggest you to grab a pen and paper and write the recipe down. If you don't have the time to do it, you can go on to my website, nastykitchen.com, and you'll find a very, very fully equip equipped blog where you find plenty of basic recipe and more, uh, and let's say more creative recipe, recipes. Then I have 10 grams of salt. This is nice sea salt, very, very classic salt. And I mix it straight into it. Then if you have the chance to use a Danish spatula, you can use a Danish spatula. And I mix the salt through the flour. I like to mix all my ingredients straight away because I don't want to forget that there's nothing worse for an Italian like me to have bread that doesn't taste like anything. I like my things very flavorful. And especially because I was a chef for 22 years. So flavor was everything. Once I mix the flour and the salt, I have my super active starter, as you can see. It's nice and bubbly. This one I fed it two hours ago, just before the masterclass, because I don't want to have it too acidic. But if you want to bread a bit more acidic, you can use something that you fermented for over two hours. And the acidity, given by the lactic acid bacteria will increase the will increase the flavor into the bread in this bowl instead i have 350 grams of water but i'm going to put only 300 grams the other 50 grams will help me understand if the flour needs a bit more water or less in this one i'm going to put roughly half of this one which will equal to 100 grams of sourdough culture. As you can see, all my ingredients are mixed together. I'm not putting anything separated. I'm not making an outer lice, of, uh, which means mixing flour and water and waiting for the gluten to develop because I don't find it necessary, especially if you're at home and you're a housewife or a father who doesn't have any time to do anything else, but wants to knock out a beautiful loaf of bread, handmade, housemade, in the least amount as possible in the least amount of time as possible at this point i'll just mix it i'll mix it until all the ingredients have been absorbed and they come into a wonderful rough looking mass so the difference from let's say a dough made with a sourdough culture and a dough made with a dry yeast or baker's yeast is that the sourdough culture activates and reacts and works in a much slower pace than the baker's yeast. That's what gives us the opportunity to create the gluten structure on its own without making any extra mechanical force or without, many, without making any uh, hard work with our hands and with our arms. That's why this bread was originally made by grandmothers. I remember my grandmother used to knit so much bread every week. It was insane. I couldn't believe it, how she could make. But now I understand it. So I can see that my dough needs that extra 50 grams of water. Okay. I can see it. And here we are. I added it all. And now I'm mixing it properly.
you can see now it's much easier to mix. This one might be a little scary for a beginner, but this is easy, perfect. You don't have to, to worry about it. Let's make sure there are no lumps and the dough is uh, evenly mixed. There we go. So you saw it's roughly about three minutes of work. Now with this wonderful tool that's called the scraper, actually in Italian, we, we translate the name as nail. This one works exactly like a nail. So cleans the bowl. You can see? So we don't wanna leave any part of the dough on the side. Here we are. So now, the, the secret is to forget about it. We're gonna leave this one here for about 15 minutes. And in 15 minutes, we're gonna go back to it and we're gonna check how this one will look because I wanna show you the magic of rest, the magic of patience. In the meantime, of course, I've organized myself because I don't have much time. And I have a dough that's already made that I made two hours ago. And this is what it looks like. You can see beautiful gluten structure. It's the same ratio, same ingredients. And this one is already proving. You can see it by the bubbles. This one will be the loaf that, we're gonna, that I'm going to use to show you how to shave your bread. So, but for now, we put it on the side. Now it's time to teach you how to make the sourdough culture. If you have the chance to go to a baker and find some sourdough culture, go there, it will be easier for you to obtain some. If you don't, you can make it yourself or you can ask a friend if he can be gonna give you some. But you also find some people that sell sourdough culture online. So you can use that too. It's up to you. But I would like you to challenge yourself and try to make your own sourdough culture. And as I say to everybody, is the, the trick is to be patient as well and to understand fermentation. The method that I use to make the sourdough culture is a method, method that I developed studying how people ferment wine. And people ferment wine in a very simple way. They let nature do their job and they just control the temperature and the timing on it. So we start by using some flour, okay? Organic flour, it's always best, not only for yourself, but also for the benefits that the nutrients that are into the flour will feed the organism that we need to create the culture, of course. So I'm gonna put roughly 40 grams of flour into this jar. And I'm going to put some water as well. These are roughly 40 grams of water. I want to go to a tech, I want to arrive to a texture that's uh, roughly like a, a butter, pancake butter. So thick, but not too thick. So I'm using half white flour and half wholemeal flour that I milled myself with my meal. i show you, this is the texture. You see, thick, but not too thick. So now, the, let's call it this little trap, it's ready. And this one will attract some bacteria that are already in the air. Let me, uh, there are some people that are light, so we put them in. So there are some bacteria in the air that we wanna collect, but also, there are some organisms that are already living into the flower and into the water, of course. The organisms that are living into the flower are most likely to be organisms that have come from the soil where the plant was planted. I hope that makes sense. So we, the, the most organic the flower is, the better it will be because there will be more organism, more natural life into this culture. So this one now, I'll cover it. And this one is already set. What I would like you to do if you're gonna try and do, use this method to make your sourdough culture is to 
make sure that you stir it. You stir the jar, you stir the container, you stir the bowl every three, six hours. It's very important because you don't want molds to develop on the surface of your culture. If you, if, you are, if you have any doubt, I've got three videos on my YouTube channel that show you step by step how to make a sour culture. And I think I have one or two on, YouTube, on Instagram as well, on my IGTV. So, but the concept is keep it stirring. This is the same method they use when they make wine. They just press the grapes, they let it sit on the skin, and they just stir it every so often for the molds not to develop. And they don't put anything else. They just let the organism that are on top of the skin, on top of the plants, to ferment the wine. In most cases, of course. And then I don't want to go deep into how people make champagne, how people make beer, and so on. Just want to focus that I adopted that method into the sourdough culture. And within two days, maximum three, I always developed a new mother, as we call her. Lievito mother, mother yeast. So make sure you stir it. Other important information that you need to know about this, it's that sometimes you might see some splitting of water. That means that the gluten that was into the flour has been eaten by the bacteria. Uh, let me raise it. Yeah. That means that the ingredients have been eaten by the bacteria. The, 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 the gluten has been eaten by the bacteria. So what you can do, you just can add a little more flour into your culture, but no feeding it yet. The feeding procedure will start when you start noticing some bubbles. I'll show you here. These amount of bubbles are way too many. You won't find this one after two days. But if you find one or two or three on the surface, on the side, that's a good sign that your fermentation has started. There is activity. The little amount of bacteria that are in there are ready to be fed. And how do we feed it? We feed it with the same amount of flour and water that we used at the beginning of the procedure. So in my case, 40 grams of flour and 40 grams of water. That's my first fed. And that will happen only on day two or day three, depending if I can see the bubbles or not. That's paramount if you're using my method. There's plenty of other methods on the internet. Some people use some fruit, some people use some tomato juice, some people use some uh, apple juice, some people use yogurt, some people put honey, sugar, I don't think it's necessary. The flour is enough sugars to feed the, the organism. And you just need to be able to understand that you are just a, a controller of the situation here. You nothing else. You're just controlling what's happening in these two ingredients that you put together, grain and water. Said that, we can start with the first uh, shot of a Q&A question, if you like, for about five minutes until we wait, then the dough has created a little bit of gluten structure. And then I show you how to shape the bread. So if you have a question, we got five minutes until four o'clock to be able to answer a few of them. So what type of flour? You can use any flour. If organic, it's better. If you can use whole meal, even better. If you can mix uh, whole meal and white flour, it's even better. And if you have some rye, you can use actually any flour. If you use some white, I'll suggest to you to use some because it's got much more uh, gluten content than whole meal and rye. So use all, well, you can do 50-50 white and rye, or white or whole meal, white and spelt, but you can also do straight 100% rye or straight 100% whole meal or straight 100% rye. You will notice, it's funny, I made a video a few months ago about this, if you use rye flour, your sourdough culture will grow much faster and much more in volume. It's insane. Even though there's less gluten, which is basically the glue that holds the gas behind the membrane, it's less. It still grows more. It's incredible. I, I can't believe still how that works. But it must be into the ingredients, into the, the food that actually the rye grain and uh, berries, milled produces for the starter. What's the tool that you were using to mix the dough? This, this one, it's called a Danish spatula in, a, in Australia. You can find that on Amazon. You can find that on many websites. It's uh, very useful because you can use it for many things. You can use it to make your pancake butter. You can use it for um, making the dough. 
anything basically that needs to be slightly whisked or mixed. And it's actually pretty tough for those. It's not very flexible. It's, it moves, but it's pretty stiff. So it's perfect for mixing the dough. But you don't have to use that 100%. You can use, a, you can use your hand, of course. You can use a spoon. There's no limit. I mean, everybody used to use um, hands before 100 years ago. So, so possibly, uh, okay. Last two questions. Is baker flour usually too heavy to use? Is plain bleach flour preferable? Uh, no, Blake, baker's flour is actually recommended uh, because that's a, a flour that is rich in gluten and definitely helps... Uh, uh, the bread develop and uh, helps uh, the the fungus, the saccharomyces, which is one of the two organisms that live in the sourdough culture, produce the gas. And the more gas it gets produced, the more gluten you need. So baker's flour has been developed to have more gluten than usual. But you can definitely use, you have to use unbleached plain flour, absolutely. And if you have some uh, whole meal or whole grain, even better. Uh, what's the temperature? What temperature does the starter culture need to be stored at? Um, preferably under 24 degrees. But because I bake every day, I keep it on my bench and I feed it once a day. Uh, but if you bake only once a week, you can feed it, use it, and put it in the fridge. Next time you bake, you take it out the day before, you feed it. You wait until it rises a bit and then you can use it and you repeat the process and you keep it in the fridge. But you can choose, you can keep it in the fridge and you can keep it on the bench, on the counter, whatever you have, whatever you prefer. No problem at all. So this one is the dough that we made together before, okay? I wanna show you that this one is still a little sloppy. It breaks. That means that the gluten hasn't developed. So the dough is not ready, but you can see how rough there is our coarse mix that is but now if we are do, following this procedure which is called stretch and fold that i'm going to show you right now you see the dough is going to build some strength some tension and that's what i do i just lift it up and put it towards the center until the dough allows me to do that usually if you do this right the dough will actually come off the bowl if it's too rough as you can see so, uh, here we go, it already comes off. So, but you see the slowly is becoming a little bit more glossy. And that's because the gluten is slowly developed. How long am I gonna do this? Only until I see that the dough doesn't stretch, doesn't rip, doesn't rip the little skin that's on top. You don't wanna break that. That's uh, very important for the dough to keep its shape when we, are going to shape the dough. So now I put this one on the side. I wash my hands and I'll show you how to shape the loaf to be put in the proving basket. Some very important tools that I would like you to buy, if you can, is this one, the scraper. This is probably the most useful tool that you can use, more than the blade, more than the Danish, more than the Danish spatula, because this one, really helps you uh, remove the dough from the bowl, uh, mix the dough, clean the bowl. It's perfect. Cut the dough on the other side, on the straight side. So it's wonderful. Now I'm going to put some flour on top. Let's say this is that dough that's fermented for five hours. Okay. This one is nice and bubbly. And now we're going to just flip it over the bench. Here we go. You can see beautiful fermentation there. So I don't want to have too much flour though, because otherwise they won't be mixed. If you can use rice flour to shape your dough, it's much better, uh, especially because it doesn't have any gluten and you want the gluten to be slightly fermented to be better digestible for human consumption. So now this one is a wonderful loaf that you can use to make pizza, you can use to make focaccia, you can use to make anything that you really like. You don't have to use this recipe only for bread. And I grab the top end here, 
in a folder on top, just like that. Very simply. You can see these beautiful bubbles, okay? That's only because I waited for the dough to tell me when it was ready. And that means I waited for the dough to be double in volume from the beginning of the dough. Keep that in mind. Make sure that you wait until the dough doubles inside before you shape it. Then I fold it like two wings and then I fold this one on top there. Okay, now I have another triangle there. What I'm gonna do, I'm gonna grab these two and lift it up and seal it like that. And this is just a method that you use for uh, people that are not very uh, used to work with dough of any kind because professionally you don't do all these folds. It's not necessary. You just need to be able to build some strength, some resistance in your dough. Then I fold this one again on top and I stitch it up like that. This one helps the structure to be more strong. You see the dough now, it's holding itself. And now I'm just going to roll it. So now I leave this one on the bench for a bit, some flour on top, I let it rest. It's very important that you rest your dough on the bench for about five to 10 minutes. So you can create a skin. That skin is gonna make sure that when you put it into your proving basket, okay, into different size proving basket, it doesn't stick either to the cloth or to the wooden banneton directly. It's very important that you do this. You need to leave the dough on the bench for a few minutes until you feel that it doesn't stick to your hands anymore. And that is usually happen when he created a skin. I have a video that speaks a lot about that on my YouTube channel because that's one of the issues that many beginners encounter at the beginning of the journey, of the sourdough journey. So this one is a little longer. How long we got on that? We got 15 minutes on the other bread. And now I want to tell you a little bit of a story behind the sourdough and behind, behind the back is yeast and, and that kind of stuff while this one dries out a bit. So I want you to, to know, I don't know if you knew that already, that baker's yeast was only introduced at the end of the 18, 19th century. So 18, 1896, 1899 were introduced because there was so much demand of bread because the population in America, around the world was growing so fast that these people needed to be fed. And the most... Uh, uh, cheap and most nutrition ingredient that we knew at the time was bread. Bread was a staple that was everywhere around the world. But in reality, we've been eating sourdough for most of our lives, for most of our evolution. Humans being out on this planet scientifically, scientifically by for 80,000 years, but we've been able to bake and this is proven, especially by a discovery made in Gobekli Tepe in Turkey very recently, uh, I think around two years ago, where they found in a very old oven some flat bread that was put there. So we've been using wheat as a nutritional ingredient for thousands of years. Then the first population to start introducing baking in their so proved baking, like we're talking now about bread, uh, in their day-to-day -day life were the Egyptian. The Egyptian were the first population to also make uh, beer and through probably making the beer, the fermentation beer, some bacteria have transferred into a jar of porridge that some people have left there. This is the legend that I found on the baking books that I've read. And all of them say that the most... Uh, recognized piece of history is that when the Egyptians started making beer, some of these bacteria from the beer transferred into a jar of porridge and these people started to use that levain to make their own bread. Do you believe it? I do believe it because most of the wonderful things in the world are made by mistake. Not all of them are made on purpose. So I do believe in that. And uh, the second population to actually produce bread for sale were actually the Greeks, Greeks and Romans. 
by Greeks, by the Greeks people, the Greeks, uh, very ancient Greek, used to have about 70 to 75 different kinds of Levain products in their bakeries. It's insane. I don't think we can find 75 products in a normal bakery right now, especially made artisanally. It's very hard. It's very hard. So imagine you go in this wonderful bakery in Greece in the probably 200 years before Christ, and you find these shelves with plenty of bread, bread rings, sesame rings, sweet breads, savory breads. Ah, I wish I lived that time. I wish I was a baker during that time because I would have definitely had my position there. And, uh, and then, of course, with time, we develop different preparation. For example, panettone is born in Italy, of course, in the 1400s. And it was a gift that was given at the weddings to the family of the wife. So it's a, it's a, and then wonderfully became a Christmas gift, uh, a gift that were given to the church. There, there's a very, very strange intrication of information around these very old leavened breads. And then we come to 900, 1900s, where population goes up to the roof and people needs to be fed. And we stopped doing sourdoughs. You need to think that until 900, we were only baking with sourdough. <clears throat> Sorry, I need to drink. I've been talking too much. So going back, for a short period of time, before 1900, actually, a, a German scientist discovered that by mixing buttermilk, which contained a little amount of acidity, and bicarb soda, it was able to produce bread as well in the shortest time ever seen. But what has this created? This created the fact that bread didn't ferment anymore. Then actually bread only lifted, like we do scones nowadays. And the recipe that everybody uses is based on cream, lemonade, and self-raising flour. And why do they come up? They come up only because into the self-raising flour, there's bicarb soda and mixed with lemonade, which contains ascorbic acid, which is an acidic powder, it lifts because it, cre it creates this chemical reaction. This is what happens if you use the recipe, this is what happens <coughs> into your mix, into your dough when you make scones. So I just want you to know, but I think that most of you uh, are aware of that. Uh, what else? Uh, yes. Jenny, you're definitely very, very lucky to have a French artisan bakery in Wagga. Uh, yeah, definitely. So in 1900, population started rising. They need to be. They needed. They needed to be fed. And what we thought, okay, let's produce mass production of bread, mass production of sliced bread in the 30s. And you cannot believe it. It was the bread that was left the most on the shelf. And instead, nowadays, it's the bread that's sold the most. Would you believe that people didn't want to buy sliced bread in the 1930s, 1920s? Yeah, so it's crazy. It's very crazy. But uh, apart from that, I have my own theory about all these gluten intolerances in 2022, since, of course, 1990. I think that's where actually is spiked to the roof. I think it's because we don't ferment the bread anymore. And not fermenting the bread allows more gluten to stay in the dough. For example, I am a baker, okay? Professionally now. I left my career as a chef. And uh, I think that it's very important that you understand one thing. When we make bread with baker yeast, even if you put as little as 1%, your bread proves in maximum two hours okay so imagine how much fermentation in two hours have happened not much you are only basically uh blown this mass made of flour and water and salt instead when you use natural fermentation as in this case we need to wait for the bacteria to start eating and what they do by eating they produce carbon dioxide which is the ingredient, the gas that lifts the dough. But this happens in a longer period of time. And while the saccharomyces, which is the fun fungi, fungi, fungo, that eats the sugars, produces carbon dioxide, 
the lactic acid bacteria eats the protein of the flour, which is mainly the gluten. So by fermenting the yodo longer, you reduce the amount of gluten that's contained into the actual end product. And not only that, if you portray your fermentation longer, like keeping your dough in the fridge for a couple of days, once it's shaped, you will find even less gluten. I've read on a book from Vanessa Kimball that's called The Sourdough Baking School. The, I think uh, she says that after 72 hours of fermentation, most of the gluten is gone in the bread. And I can tell you that that's uh, actually very true because if you leave your dough into a bowl for 72 hours on the bench and it's nicely, perfectly textured, if you go there after 72 hours, you find a product that looks like this. I'll show you. You find a product that looks like this. Very sloppy, it breaks very easily. And that's because the glue of the dough it's broken apart because it's been eaten by the lactic acid bacteria. So when we bake sourdough bread, we have in actually a symbiosis of two creatures, fungi on one side and lactic acid bacteria on the other one. And I'm glad there is some, per, some people on to this masterclass now that just said they have an autoimmune disease, a thyroid disease, and she wants to learn how to make sourdough baking in the hope that, I, that she doesn't have to give up on bread. And I really hope that this, this will work for you because everybody deserves to be able to have a wonderful slice of bread whenever they want. And the sourdough, I think, is the only way to go. And but sourdough, I want to make this point very clear as well, is not a flavor. Sourdough is a method of fermentation. It's insane. Sourdough, it's not a flavor, guys. It's not called sourdough only because it's sour. If you, if you all try my bread, you'll see that most of it, if I ferment it right like I want to, is not sour at all. You can make sweet baking. Why can we make panettone? It doesn't taste acidic. Why can we make focaccia? It doesn't taste acidic. Why can we make pizza? It doesn't taste acidic. Because we ferment it in the right timing, with the right temperature. And there's a lot of experience behind it. But I just want you to keep in mind, remember, sourdough is not a flavor. It's rather a method of fermentation. And that's why we call it in Italy, the mother dough. We call it the pasta madre. But now let's go back to the shaping of this dough. You can see now this one, a sit for a little. I'm gonna put some flour. I'm gonna use this wonderful scraper, metal scraper here, to show you another step that you can use, okay? You can tie to your bread. If you're not very manually, uh, uh, able okay you can just push your bread okay inside rolling like that inside rolling like that and you can see how this one tends and becomes like a balloon here we go and you can see now this is wonderful now i'm gonna grab one of my banatones or proving basket as you want to call it i'm gonna use only one Okay, and I'm gonna put this one there. Yep. I'm gonna flip my dough upside down, okay? I'm gonna grab it, stick it like that, okay? Lift it, as you can see, and put it into my dough. Then I make sure I seal this little gap. I make sure I put some flour in the edges because I can feel it's a little sticky. And this is your loaf ready to go. You see, it's bubbly, it's fluffy, it's, uh, sorry, fluffy, it's gassy. And this one now needs to go in the fridge to hold its shape. That's my suggestion for everybody. If you don't want your bread to spread when you start baking it, first of all, use a very hot baking vessel or baking tray. Second, make sure that you leave your sourdough for two hours at least in the fridge. If you want to go the next level, put it for 10 minutes in the freezer. So it creates a little shell that, that will firm it up a bit. Too. Especially if you want to become a sourdough artist, a sourdough Instagram influencer. You know, 
these are the tricks that you need to learn. Instead, if you just want to bake at home, keep it in the fridge for two hours or up to 24 hours or up to 48 hours. This one will be fine. If you ferment it, as I told you, for five hours on the bench and then you shape it, you can keep it in for two days in the fridge and then you bake it straight away. You don't need to wrap this one. You actually want it to slightly dry a bit. So I'm going to put this one in my fridge right now and wait until tomorrow for baking it. And I'm going to give this one to a friend of mine that loves my bread. Now, the timer of the bread is probably one or two minutes away. So we are ready to lift the lid and see what is actually happening there. Okay. Here we go. Ready? Are you excited? Hopefully, I haven't messed up. Hopefully, it's going to work. Who knows? Who knows? That's uh, what everybody asks themselves when they have to lift the lead. Here we go. You can see that's a wonderful loaf of bread that's grown massively. Okay, you can see a wonderful gap here. And this one is the one that we score with a bread knife, with a small serrated knife. Now, because this one doesn't have any color, but it's developed very well, I'm gonna put this one, I'm gonna uh, put this one, I'm gonna put this one back in the oven to color, but I'm gonna put it at the top of my oven because the heat in a gas oven comes more from the top and less on the bottom. So you see the color on the other one will be more intense. If you don't have a baking vessel, don't be afraid. You can achieve the same level. We got some for you for a few dollars. This one that came out is probably five bucks and a piece of foil is probably 20 cents. So instead of spending 250 bucks on a baking vessel like I did, you can actually spend more, in, more money on the ingredients that you want to put into your body. Because remember, we are what we eat. I prefer you to spend, invest your money into the ingredients, organic ingredients, if you can, if you can trust them, if you can source them at a natural shop, if you can source them in a place where you trust the your uh, seller, that's very important. So you see, no issue at all. I made this one this morning, the other one yesterday and they worked exactly the same. So now I'm gonna put this one back in the oven to color and in about 15 minutes, they'll be ready to be not sliced. Make sure you don't slice them straight away, but they will be able to be looked at. Actually, let me put this one here because this is very cool. You see how this one is bubbling? The sourdough culture is very active. Probably is feeling there's a lot of heat into the room. So it wants to do something. Now, one of the tricks not to get your dough stuck to your fingers is to wet your hands. I'll show you now. Let me put it into a bigger bowl. Here we go. Remove this one. Wet fingers. And lift it up. You see how this one has developed very well now? In only half an hour. Look, now I can pull it up wonderfully. Here we go. Perfect. Now I'm going to put it on the bench just because I, I want to tie it up a bit. I'm going to clean this one. If you trust the process and you wait at the right time, baking sourdough is actually a very, very simple craft. It doesn't require much knowledge. It only requires experience. And it only requires three ingredients, flour, water, and salt. Now, I just want to tense it a bit. You can see now this one is very glossy. Beautiful bread. And this one is just white flour. But... Next time, maybe we can do, we can put some percentages of different grains in it and it's wonderful. Put it in there. Now I'm gonna cover it. This one is the bread that I'm gonna shape tonight. So in five hours, this one will be proven. I'll probably be posting some pictures on Instagram. So if you don't follow me on Instagram yet, please do so. And uh, if you don't follow the source book foods Waga, Please do so because the idea of this masterclass, it's from them. So we need to thank them to, for this um, event 
and there will be more in the future because I really enjoy teaching. And uh, I think this is a craft that everybody should possess. So make sure you follow us on Instagram. Make sure you follow them on Instagram. And uh, I'll be posting some pictures and some stories about this later on tonight. What else? I think we are right for the last 15 minutes of Q&A session. So go for it. Push everything. Ask everything you got. Because this is your chance. And uh, Jenny, this is to you. If you would like to share a few words, you're free to do so. I can unmute you and uh, you can share a few words before we start the Q&A session. Um, I just want to say a big thank you. Um, Giuseppe, you have been, sorry about all the background noise here. We've got a bit of a okay. birthday party outside. So there's probably lots of kids' voices out there. But, um, you know, I think I always put off sourdough making because I, I thought it was really complex and difficult. Um, and as, as Giuseppe said, I, you know, a friend of mine up north put me on to Giuseppe um, and we got talking and I suppose I was really lucky because Giuseppe was like, send me pictures, let me know how you're going. If you've got any questions along the way, let me know. And I felt like I was sending him about five or six pictures a day at one point. Is this okay? Is this normal? And, um, and it really helped me to feel confident um, in it. And, and even, you know, just now watching the way you talk about it, um, it, you know, hearing the, the, the history and the culture and, you know, we are a bit, um gluten intolerant we we can have little bits but i generally don't feel too good if i eat um if i eat too much of it so i think just really understanding the, the fermentation side of sourdough and and the difference that it can make you know you know i always relate everything back to gut health um i love sourdough um i probably eat too much of it um but it really is an art. I feel like it's an art, sourdough making, all the folding that you've got to do. It's kind of meditative, you know, playing with something with your hands and creating something and um, being able to enjoy it at the end of it. And it's taken me, like, I'm still trying to get the consistency right. And, you know, I was doing too, you know, creating too much starter at one point. I thought I was kicking goals because I had a full jar of starter. And then I was like, oh no, I've actually only got to keep a little bit of starter the whole time. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. So I'm much. just always learning things and playing with different, um, you know, playing with different flowers and, you know, some of them don't work out, which is a bit disappointing, but then I learned from it. And it's just a really fun process, I suppose um as, as i said we're lucky to have the french bakey here because when my breads don't work out i can pop down and get a loaf from him um but but you have been just such a a massive um support for me on you know with all the, the i suppose the help and the questions i've been able to ask you um so a big thank you for, for giving your time to me but also for for you know putting on this um webinar webinar now because it, it does help to actually see things live in person and have all those different comments and tips to go with it absolutely thank you so much jenny i appreciate your words and uh, i've enjoyed this uh, other experience and uh, i'm glad that you asked away all your question in your journey because i think that's fundamental some people really slow down in their asking because they are afraid they ask too much and it's, if somebody like if you find somebody like me feel free to ask if i have time when i have time i'll answer i'll answer as many as i can you just need to be patient and i give you my answers so it's uh, it's wonderful that you send me your pictures as i said it's very easy for me to give advice if i see what's going on because if I only read, I don't see at what stage you are. So that's why I ask people to send me short videos of their starter or their loaf or their dough in the same pictures of their stuff, what they're doing. So I can actually guide them a little better. It won't be like I'll be there on them, with them, one-on-one, -on -one, but at least it's something that through technology we can achieve these days. So these are the good parts of technology, you know, to be able to organize all of that, to have an Instagram live right now, to have uh, so many people on the online class it's wonderful and thank you so much for every idea uh, it will be and I uh, would love to do more 
And last thing, if you are in Sydney, if you are in New South Wales, go and have a look at these guys. So make sure that you understand they are the source bulk food store in Wagga. And they are a wonderful family and uh, beautiful people. I can see it. And they make sourdough too. So now they can give you a few more guidance as well. Okay, so let's start from uh, Sharna. If we were used to use, if we were to use this dough for pizza or focaccia, do we still shape it? No, it's not necessary to shape it if you want to do pizza or focaccia. You just do, you can, do, you can do the same amount for a normal pizza tray of a focaccia, no worries at all. <clears throat> and uh, the same with pizza, depending on the size of the pizza that you want to do, you can just make your balls or your squares ready on the trays. You don't need to shape it as I did for the loaf. That shaping is not only necessary for the dough. Uh, can all the grains be used in sourdough, like multigrain bread? Absolutely. You can use whole grains in sourdough. If you do a recipe like this one, you don't need to soak if you use a recipe like the one that we made today with the 450 grams of flour, 350 grams of water, 10 grams of salt and 100 grams of starter, you don't need to put water, extra water. You don't need to soak your seeds beforehand. You can just put them in there. Uh, for Rachel, my starter is going well, but I'm not sure how much I'm supposed to be feeding in relation to amount of starter. The basic rule of feeding the starter is one to one to one. And that means if in your jar you have 100 grams of starter, you want to feed it with 100 grams of flour and 100 grams of water. That makes become your starter 300 grams. So you want to use as much as you can and have just a little bit for the next bake. You don't have to build up starter and then find yourself with three, four, 15 jars in the fridge. <coughs> That you don't know what to do with it and that's why so many people have developed this card recipe and this card is unnecessary if you just keep a little starter this card is not necessary but i understand that some people are afraid they want to feed it and they have this card but this card basically is just uh, some sour flour of water there's no strength in, strength in there anymore there's no um, much uh, uh, activity as well of fungus, but there's a lot of activity of lactic acid bacteria. So you'll add into your preparation a bit more of acidity, which definitely en will enhance the flavor of the end product, but it doesn't give any other benefit. Especially if you want to make some fermentation, you need to use some active starter to be able to, to make your preparation a little healthier. Uh, now we are ready to see the end product. I think one of the loaf is ready. So this is one. As you can see, this is quite gorgeous. And I want to see pictures like that when you make it, guys. Okay? I want to see you trying. It doesn't have to look like that. But as long as you can make bread once, and then you get inspired, and then you want to do more. So I made this dough yesterday afternoon. And this last night, I put it in the fridge. And he stayed in the fridge all night. You see, he dried out, not much. And make sure. This is the bread, okay? Nicely golden. I want you to hear the sound of the bottom. It's the sound hollow, like a drum. That shows you and tells you that the dough is cooked. So now it's very important that you don't cut the dough straight out of the oven because it will it will look like it's undercooked. So now the bread is still gelatinizing, it's still cooking, it's still ex uh, releasing part of the steam, part of the water that has evaporated while baking. So we need to leave it like that for at least 20 minutes. I don't know if you can resist 20 minutes at home with a smooth, beautiful, if you make homemade butter, how can you resist a slice of home, slice of hot bread? So while this one cools down a bit, I want to show you how to shape the ciabatta as well, how to cut the ciabatta. I promised you that at the beginning, and then we're going to live with that. And I'm going to slice a slice of this one as well. But I want to show you when you have leftover doughs, don't throw them away. 
Yesterday I made some rice sourdough, as you can see, and I made some white sourdough for my customers. I have a little shop that I supply from home here in Adelaide. And uh, I had some extra dough and I put them in a tin and I made a wonderful sandwich loaf. So you buy yourself a sandwich tin and then you can make uh, anything you like. You can make pan brioche, you can make brioche dough, anything. You can make bakka or sandwich loaf. I'm gonna show you this one how it looks. Let me find a knife. So I baked this one this morning and this, is, this looks fantastic. Look at that. It's got like a little heart. Oh, a vase, maybe a vase, a cup. So that's a sandwich loaf. This one is nicely moist, slightly acidic because it's fermented long and outside, but it's uh, extra dough that I didn't have to throw away. I wanna show you how to cut the ciabatta now. Flour, generous, generous. Don't be afraid. Then you're gonna clean it. All the extra flour that stays on the bench can be the flour that you use to feed your starter. So you collect all the dough, all the flour that was there, and you put it into your starter. Now, this is a ciabatta dough. You see how many bubbles, how fluffy that is. Do you guys know what a ciabatta is? Ciabatta is the most uh, known, probably, loaf of bread made in Italy. Okay? So here we are. This is the ciabatta dough. Now I'm just gonna shape these sides. Okay. Just to hold it nicely. There we go. And now generously the top as well. Now I need to go and grab two trays, two trays like that. So we can... and this one is ready as well here we go we've got the trays here so it doesn't have to stick so it's a very wet dough okay now I'm going to make some ciabatta loaf so I'm going to cut it in the middle I separate it. That's one. And now I'm gonna cut it like that. Okay. Once you cut it, you need to flip it. And the one, the part that was upside down needs to go up. And then you put it on a tray. My kids love these rolls because they get so crunchy. Absolutely, you will be able to share the recording of this because I will publish the complete masterclass on my YouTube channel. So you will be able to send it, you will be able to send them the link. So now I'll put this one in the oven straight away. Now I'll do the same with this one. Sit down. You can use the same for cut the same dough that you do the bread. And before you do those little stretch and fold that we did after the second time, after 30 minutes, you can add a bit more water in there. If you add a bit more water, you can increase the hydration of your dough. And when you do that, once the, the gluten is developed, that's that process is called bassinage especially if you do it by hand. Here we go. Last one. So there we go. We put this one in. We shake some flour off and we put that on. Now my secret for focaccia is not just to mix olive oil. The secret is to put olive oil and water. So I have some residual water in there. Do some olive oil, gal Italian herbs, generous, some garlic powder, just to flavor it up a bit. 
that's my chef side. You see, I can't be not creative. I can't be put many flavors together. This, this wonderful tool, that's a frothing whisk to make an emulsion, a very creamy emulsion. And that only happens if you put water in oil. You can see how creamy that's become. Let me put a light so you can see. You see how that's creamy now? And now I'm gonna pour that straight onto the focaccia. Like that. This is called the brine, focaccia brine. You can find a recipe on my YouTube channel as well where I teach you how to make it. But now you saw it and then you poke it. So the water and the oil will sink into these beautiful pockets of goodness. And what does the water do? The water keeps the focaccia holes very soft, very uh, succulent. And oil will fry the surface to make it nice and crunchy. Yeah, pinch of salt. And once the ciabattas are done, I'm gonna put this one in the oven. So this one is the bread that we did together before, baked it. Much like this. Here we go. What a sound. It's still steamy, but it's a wonderful loaf of bread. You can see the smoke coming out. And that's the guys what you'll be able to do 100% after this masterclass. And uh, I wanna give you two more things. I wanna give you my phone number to reach out to me. You can reach out to me on WhatsApp. You can reach out to me on Facebook as Giuseppe Joe Nasty. You can reach out to me on Instagram as Nasty Kitchen. And uh, if you need more support, text me or call me on 0478-711-185. Thank you so much for being part of this wonderful event. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time to invest in your time to learn a once in a lifetime masterclass. So I hope you learned as much as I could possibly give you. I hope that this is going to stay with you forever. You're going to pass this knowledge onto your generation. I hope you're going to pass this knowledge onto your kids and your kids will pass it on to their kids because I believe that every household should be able to make at least once a week one of these. And thank you so much, everybody. I will stop the recording. You know where you can find us. You know where you can find Jenny as well. If you can go and find them in New South Wales, uh, the source of book of Slore in Wagga, and uh, if you are in Adelaide, come and see me. I work at Foodland Pasadena. And uh, if you don't, well, you can reach us on social media for sure. Thank you so much, everyone. I don't know if you want to add anything else, Jenny. No, I think I'll leave it at that. I think it's just been wonderful. So thank you again. And thanks for um, joining us, everyone. It's been lovely. Thank you so much, guys. And uh, I'll see you soon. Have a wonderful evening. Happy Saturday and happy Sunday.